Yo, what's going on guys? It's Cynical and welcome back to another video. Today for you guys, I thought we'd finally sit down and talk about Crash Bandicoot 4 as uh, I haven't actually done any content towards Crash 4 ever since its initial reveal a few months back and also considering that we are just under a month away from the actual game releasing and next week there is also a demo dropping for those who pre-ordered. Yeah, I thought it would be high time to actually uh, gawk over this app absolute masterclass of a continuation. I am so fucking excited for this. I am a massive Crash Bandicoot fan. Uh, for people who have been hanging around here on my channel for a little while now, you'll know that uh, I actually do cover Crash from time to time, especially when the whole Insane Trilogy thing was going on. I was pumping out content for that, so it only makes sense that we do the same for Crash 4. Uh, I'm so excited because this is a true-to-the-bone return to the classic authentic formula of Crash Bandicoot and is also a true continuation from Crash 3 Warped. Toys for Bob are responsible for Crash Bandicoot 4, the same people who brought to life the Spyro Reignited trilogy. I was expecting that Vicarious Visions would be the one to push the franchise forward as they were responsible for bringing to life the Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy. So yeah, Toys for Bob have kind of swapped over to that of Crash now. So maybe the same is going to happen with Vicarious visions with Spyro going forward, but we'll have to see what happens in the sense of Spyro's continuation. I am absolutely taken back though by the amount of work and effort that Toys for Bob have put into Crash to make it a true return to form of Crash Bandicoot. Uh, we're not having any sort of wide open crazy 3D spaces like we saw in Twin Sanity, though of course I did enjoy Twin Sanity, definitely prefer the OG formula found on the PS1 titles, and that's exactly what we're getting right here. We are of course getting uh, expansions on top of the original formula to add more layers and variety to that classic gameplay, which is fantastic to see. So today I thought I'd just give my thoughts and opinions currently on Crash 4 towards all of the new stuff that is jam-packed into this return. So let's talk about this. As I was saying before, this is a true continuation from Crash 3. That isn't necessarily to say that any other Crash game after Crash 3 isn't considered here, this is just picking up after the events of Crash 3. Uh, of course, this game is playing around with the whole alternate reality and dimension idea, which could very well bring in the other games and lore towards them into the mix. Multiverse is used within the official PR description for Crash 4, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we can tap into all sorts of other areas of Crash games if, of course, Toys for Bob are wanting to do that. I also noticed on the Wumper Island stage, there's a fridge outside of Crash's house and some magnets spelling out the word Crunch. Crunch, of course, being a character that was introduced in Crash Bandicoot Wrath of Cortex. While this could be an easter egg, it may also be referencing the fact that Crunch is existing somewhere within this current timeline. At the end of Crash 3, we end up sending Cortex way back in time after the final boss battle, along with, of course, Entropy as well, returning them to baby forms. So it seems like like the amount of time that has actually passed between Crash 3 and Crash 4 is quite some time, as of course in Crash 4 they are back to being fully grown adults. They manage to obtain this power to start ripping through dimensions, and this sets the premise for Crash 4. Now, uh, this is going to have very similar themes to that of Crash 3 in the sense of going through different time periods. This is focusing on that, but then it also focuses on alternate dimensions, which we get a little bit more context towards with the recently revealed alternate version of Torna, where in an alternate dimension she is her own hero, where she succeeded and is most likely the one that ended up saving Crash rather than the other way around in the uh, normal Crash timeline that we're used to with Crash saving Torna in Crash Bandicoot 1. But yeah, it's going to have that similar theme with the uh, level design and level variety with seeing all sorts of different time periods similar to that of Crash 3. So let's leeway into the actual level designs. There are a lot of different levels that I would say are similar or more so inspired through previous Crash titles, but namely of course uh, the Crash Bandicoot 3 levels. The variety here is absolutely 
thick with seeing a futuristic-esque level, swamp levels, ice levels, pirate-themed levels, apocalypse, dinosaur, sewer, oriental. Again, a lot of these are very sort of similar to the different uh, level varieties that we had in Crash 3. With the current day hardware, there's a lot more character going on throughout. The levels are known as dimensions, so the dimensions being the theme of the actual level. It seems like we're going to be getting multiple levels within one dimension as we've seen for the pirate dimension. There is a level where we can play as either Crash or Coco, which yes, we are able to play as Coco throughout any level that we're able to play as Crash. But then we see a different level from the pirate dimension playing as Torna. The classic level layout does in fact return with the straightforward linear progress down the hallway, avoiding any sort of traps or enemies along the way. We've also got the traditional 2.5D sections where the level might transition from the hallway setup into the 2.5D setup, along with, of course, the bonus stages returning too. What adds new gameplay twists, though, to these level layouts is most certainly the new moves that we can utilize. Rail grinding is here, something similar from the Ratchet and Clank series is now found in Crash Bandicoot 4, which I totally think is a really, really cool idea. We can grind on top of the rails whilst collecting Wampa Fruit and having to also spin to collect the crates that will be positioned along the way. We can jump underneath the rail, which we'll have to use to avoid some traps that will be positioned along the way, as well as also being able to swing from left to right whilst underneath to collect any crates. The rope swinging as well, just, just rope swinging, we'll have to uh, Tarzan and monkey swing from rope to rope, as well as that crash can wall run. Yes, there will be some sections where we'll have to jump from one wall to another. It's not just the new inbuilt moves for specifically Crash and Coco that really do add a new twist to the level layouts, but most certainly the new masks that enable us to utilize brand new powers, which even furthermore progresses the new spin on the gameplay that can be found throughout. So far we've seen three different masks, though there will be a total of four, and each of these allow us to do something different. So Eka Eka is a gravity power, allowing us to shift gravity in different directions say if there is a platform on top of the roof then we can shift the gravity to then start running along the roof. Kind of reminds me of the clank sections that can be found in Ratchet and Clank Into the Nexus if you guys ever played that. Kapunawa allows us to slow down time as some platforms and some levels may be moving too fast. We simply press the activation button, they will slow down, we can now make our way over. And Delani Loli who can phase shift in different platforms as well as other objects like crates. So with these new moves and abilities, it's really, really going to give some brand new oomph to that of Crash 4, whilst also retaining that classic gameplay. Of course, Crash's classic moveset is here, the slide, the double jump, as well as the belly flop. Two of those were abilities that we obtained throughout Crash 3. I don't think that all of the abilities that Crash learnt throughout Crash 3 is going to be present here in Crash 4, or at least from the footage that we've seen so far. I'm mainly looking towards the one bazooka as well as the tornado spin. Perhaps maybe these will be something that we do unlock a little bit later on as we progress. But the absolutely necessary moves are here. We most certainly need to talk about the flashback tape system that was recently revealed at Gamescom. Uh, this is very very similar to that of the death routes that are found in Crash 2 and Crash 3. When a player progresses through a, a certain level in Crash 4, they may come across a tape. They have to bring this tape all the way to the end of the level without dying. Doing so will grant them access to a special bonus level known as a flashback tape level. These are ultra difficult special challenges for Crash 4, which in hindsight are sort of similar to I guess you could say the uh, Embryo special challenges that were seen in Crash 1. Those were known to be just hard as fucking rocks. Kind of reminds me of those except the, these look even harder, like even harder. They're designed to absolutely push your Crash Bandicoot skills to the limit and will put your sanity on the gat dang line. What I think I love most about this system though is there is actually a bit of lore behind it in the sense of this takes us back to before the beginning events of Crash Bandicoot 1 with inside of Neocortex's tower. Now of course in case you guys don't know, uh, Crash Bandicoot was created by Neocortex, he was meant to be 
uh, one of the villains in amongst the group that Neocortex created and was meant to of course assist Neocortex in taking over the world. But these are the trials that Neocortex put Crash Bandicoot through to train and test his skills. This is why they are known as flashback tapes. And whilst you're actually playing through these levels, there is this really, really cool like uh, CRT filter going on over the screen with a date stamp of 1996, of course the same year that Crash Bandicoot 1 came out. So we get a little bit of origin insight going on right here, which I think is just such the coolest thing. What an absolutely fantastic way of uh, incorporating hardest rock levels, whilst also making the story side of things make sense at the same time. The inverted level system is also a brand new feature to come forth for Crash 4, which again adds a new layer to the challenge aspect. This mirrors any level that you go through, but then also adds a unique filter on that will actually affect gameplay. Some examples are Color Splash, which starts the level off as a blank white canvas, and when you spin as Crash Bandicoot, it will create paint, painting the actual level. There is an underwater filter, which makes an underwater based filter over your screen, but also affects the gameplay where there is low gravity. There is also an old time invert option that is sort of like an old timey camera filter over your screen, but also at the same time, it actually does increase the overall gameplay speed. It's been described that each dimension will contain its own invert. Once you complete that inverted version of that level from that dimension, you will then unlock that invert option to be able to use on any level throughout the game. While playing the inverted level, the Wampa Fruit changes to what looks like grapes. Now, with collecting these grapes throughout specifically the inverted version, you're going to be able to obtain a total of three different gems. We can see in the Tawny gameplay, there's like a little uh, counter of gauge. With the more grapes that you collect, the gauge increases to hit three different gem marks. Through and through, this most certainly adds more replayability to the overall experience, with each of these giving you a different gameplay experience with all of the different invert options. Crash Bandicoot 4 also introduces two different playstyle modes, Retro and Modern. Retro is limiting the amount of lives you have, though you'll most likely be able to collect lives throughout the game. Once the life counter hits zero, that is it, it is game over. And Modern allows you to collect as many lives as you want without any type of limitation. If you lose your lives, you are able to simply just restart the level. The blog post also mentions that the game also counts deaths. So I would say that you can either check your total amount of deaths in a menu screen, or when you finish the game, it will display a bunch of in-game stats from throughout your gameplay experience. The classic time trial system is also set to return, though we haven't seen any official gameplay of which we have seen at the start of the pirate level that there is the spinning clock sitting right there, which indicates yes, time trials are returning for Crash 4. The playable character side of things is definitely one thing that I'm most certainly looking forward to. It gives me heavy reminders and vibes of that of Crash Twin Sanity. I guess that was the big new feature of Twin Sanity, being able to play as both Neo Cortex as well as his daughter Nina. In Crash Bandicoot 4, as as of right now, we know that there are a total of five playable characters, though I think that's probably going to be the complete quota. We have Crash Bandicoot, Coco Bandicoot, Neo Cortex, Dingo Dial, as well as the recently revealed Torna from Crash Bandicoot 1. Both Crash and Coco are going to be the characters that we mainly play throughout the game, both of which do play pretty much the exact same. However, there are massive gameplay differences when looking at Cortex, Dingo Dial, and Torna. You won't be able to play as these characters on the same levels as Crash and Coco play, though they will be able to play in a different area of that level, as well as also having their own unique levels, and we'll be able to see the story from their perspective and what they're getting up to during the timeline. Cortex's gameplay consists of mainly using his blaster to be able to uh, warp enemies into platforms, whether they be just standard platforms or bouncing platforms. I also absolutely love the uh, the big old head dash that Cortex can perform whilst in midair to uh, gain some extra distance. Praise the almighty Wampa Lord Dengo Dial is playable. His gameplay consists of using his little suck cannon type thing, which is actually changed from a flamethrower that we see in the OG games. As it's explained, he has retired his days of being a villain to open up a diner, which is sort of interesting, obviously, in his own story or timeline, uh, all of his world is getting thrown into chaos. With this 
suck cannon, we can suck up crates to collect Wumper Fruits. We can also suck up other objects like TNTs in order to destroy objects blocking our path. We can use the suck cannon to also hover, which is a nice little touch. And Torna has returned to be yet another playable character. This is not the same Torna from Crash 1, but a Torna from an alternate dimension. And she has more of the hero setup going on here in Crash 4 from that dimension. The main gameplay aspect for her is her hookshot that she'll be able to use to traverse throughout different levels. While it is really cool to see a lot of different playable characters throughout the game, which even furthermore pushes the variety of gameplay aspect, I do hope that the major focus is going to be both Crash and Coco retaining that classic Crash Bandicoot gameplay. It will be nice to change up the pace of things every so often with being thrown into the shoes of a different character, but I am hoping that it is about 80%, 70% Crash gameplay and the remainder of which being the other characters. Within this game there are just over 100 different levels to play through, so this is going to be a thick boy Crash experience. Considering that when we look at Crash 1, 2, and 3, they're pretty short games. They only consist of about 30 odd levels, so to see a Crash game sitting here at about 100 means that the overall game time for Crash 4 will be pretty lengthy. I'm not expecting some crazy 30 hour experience, but with all the additional challenges and whatnot, it's definitely going to be the thickest Crash game of which. It doesn't look like there's going to be a heavy emphasis on vehicle based levels, which honestly I'm really happy about. I never really liked them overly too much throughout the Crash games. Uh, even when looking towards the polar levels as well as the per the tiger levels throughout Crash 2 and 3. However though the jet board does return from Crash 2 which I'm actually happy to see. I didn't mind these stages overly too much but just with the amount of different playable characters in the game the vehicle levels have most likely been sacrificed uh, due to how many different playable characters we have which honestly pretty damn stoked about. All of those classic crates return, the jumping Wampa box, the normal box, the nitro TNT exclamation box, uh, but we have seen two new boxes which are the flame crate as well as the golden Wampa crate. Uh, busting open the golden Wampa crate will spawn a golden Wampa, which is equivalent to 20 Wampa fruits. The outfit system is new for Crash 4, allowing you to dress the characters in all sorts of different outfits. At this stage, it looks like it's only Crash and Coco, but could also be the other characters too. Now, these are obtained via collecting the gems throughout levels, so of course making sure you collect all crates. Or as it's also been described, it's certain different challenges of which none of these will be microtransaction based. There are no microtransactions in Crash 4, which is fantastic to see, so you obtain these by playing the game. Bless. And finally, let's talk about the character redesigns. So yeah, the characters for the most part have all been completely redesigned for Crash 4. Now I will say, I don't mind them. Uh, I do wish, and I'll be honest here, I do wish that they ended up using the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy models. But however, there is a reason as explained by Toys for Bob as to why these characters have received a slight redesign, and that is because they're wanting to veer more in that cartoony aesthetic, where Naughty Dog used cartoons throughout the 90s as a source of inspiration to design the characters for the original Crash Bandicoot, so that's hence the reason why we received these redesigns. Uh, they still stay authentic to that of the source material from the original trilogy, which I do appreciate, it's not like we're getting some absolute crazy uh, Mind Over Mutants or Crash of the Titans redesigns right here. They still look like their original selves. Both Aku Aku and Uka Uka pretty much look like the exact same, but when we look towards like Crash Bandicoot, Entropy, Cortex, uh, Coco, Engine, they are slightly different looking. The only thing that I really don't like is number one for Crash, uh, the fur that was sort of present there in the Insane Trilogy looked so nice. And here it's not present. Again, this coincides with the whole cartoon aesthetic focus. And the other thing too here is Cortex's head. It's more rounded rather than the flat sort of square top that the original has. Those are really the only two things that I'm just slightly, slightly disappointed in. Otherwise, I really don't mind the character redesigns. I'm sure that we'll get absolutely used to them through and through by the end of finishing Crash 4. 
And I think Toys for Bob have done a really nice job of retaining that style, but adding a new type of flair to these characters. However, guys, that is it. That is all of my thoughts and everything to do with Crash Bandicoot 4 that we know of as of right now. I just simply cannot wait. This is a true return to form for Crash and a true continuation of which too. There is a demo releasing next week for those who ended up pre-ordering Crash 4 digitally. It will give you access to two separate levels. My standpoint on this is, yeah, it's it's a little bit strange that Activision are locking this behind a digital pre-order. Uh, they did the same with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. And I know the reception towards this as of right now isn't exactly the most positive. Way back in the day, the idea of a demo was to give the consumer a little taste test towards the video game product in order to see if they actually want to fork out the money to buy the final product when it releases. This is, to a degree, a sort of anti-consumer setup where you're going to be getting the game anyway if you've of course already pre-ordered it, and while it is nice to be able to play a little slice of it early before the release of the game, that's not exactly the total idea of a demo. The other side of the coin though is, yes, uh, it's nice to get that little slice, and also at the same time too, demos aren't overly too common in this day and age of the gaming industry. So I, I have to say it's nice to see that the game is receiving a demo, a lot of AAA games don't tend to to get them this day, not saying that Crash 4 is quite AAA, but a lot of big title games don't tend to get demos. I just kind of wish that it wasn't locked behind that paywall so that absolutely everyone can experience it without having to uh, pre-order the game digitally. And of course, this also means for the people that pre-ordered the game physically, they end up missing out on this as this offer is only for the digital version. I cannot wait to play the full package come October 2nd. We are not too far away from this bad boy releasing. It has been a long time coming. In the comment section down below guys, let me know your thoughts and opinions on the current Crash Bandicoot 4. I would love to know. However guys, I'm cynical. Hopefully you have a fantastic day and until next time guys, I'll catch you later. Peace.